we're at the end of a civilization that's cresting and crashing, and COVID has helped sort of give it the <laughs> the oomph to cross over. And there's going to be this convergence of culture tissue that starts to disassociate itself from the rotting corpse of the previous civilization. The thing is, we're in that moment of deep overlap and uh and we feel that all right what's going on everybody this is justin murphy and you are watching or listening to the other life podcast this week we are speaking with monica bellavon monica is the author of a substack called covidian aesthetics and she is one of the founders of a new web3 production studio called the accursed share this is obviously a reference to the work of the French philosopher Georges Bataille, who listeners of the podcast will know is a favorite of mine and someone I've you know done some work on in, in my own right in recent years. So we had a lot to talk about. This is absolutely fascinating. Uh, Monica is just an interesting person. She actually is Peruvian. She comes from a family of diplomats in Peru, actually a dynasty of diplomats in Peru. And she later goes to the United States to study design at Harvard and you know she finds the academic environment somewhat stifling decides to leave does a substack goes hard into web3 she clearly kind of sees the uh world historical significance of of crypto for the art world and she's just one of the you know i think most interesting and forward thinking people to come from that kind of design and art world and really start throwing themselves headlong into the crypto world. I really see her as an example of that. The Substack Covidian aesthetics is uh, very wild and fascinating. And she's just an all around, you know, very cool, educated, uh, bon vivant uh, type of person I, I quite enjoy talking with. So we talked about Spengler, we talked about Fickenstein and Duchamp, we talked about Nietzsche and Bataille, of course, we talked all about crypto and NFTs, and so much more. So I hope you enjoy this. I certainly did. And uh, Monica is very open to collaborators and wants to hear from people who are interested in art, NFTs, crypto, and philosophy. So go subscribe to her newsletter at covidianaesthetics.substack.com and go learn more about her current NFT project at accursedshare.art. I will put links to both of those in the show notes. All right, everyone. I hope you enjoy it. Thanks for listening. Let's get on to the show. All right. So Monica, why don't we start with when you left South America to study design at Harvard? Bring us back to this time and help my audience understand what your overarching interests in design are or were, and specifically what you found at Harvard. At Harvard, I found a very um, congealed environment. Uh, there were right opinions to have, uh, right ways to be, right ways to think, and uh, and they were quite narrow. So it was a rather puritanical, um, parochial environment uh, with an enormous uh, endowment. <laughs> and, well, in that sense, it was quite unsatisfactory. It's got the best library collection in the world. And uh, and you make the most of that. But in terms of culture, it was already stale. And this is 2011 to 2013. My interest in design was uh, mostly morphology at the time, but it deviated significantly into uh, something that is almost uh, the mythology of design. Uh, it's an interest that I pursue with my husband. and. Um, and that we'll be sharing more about with soon. Um, there wasn't a lot of space for the sort of um, exploration that I'm interested in. It's a very good place if you are wired in certain ways, if you have certain predispositions. I don't have them. So, <laughs> so now I'm doing Web3. And when did you first have the idea that crypto or what is sometimes called web three was the path for you. Did that come to you during your Harvard days or when did you first have that interest? 
<laughs> I'm late to crypto, as late as they come. Uh, I had a notion of what crypto was. Well, I never engaged with the space. And it only began to really forcibly present itself in my map and command my interest and my attention last year when I started doing Covidian Aesthetics. Okay, so tell us a little bit more about your newsletter, Covidian Aesthetics. What was the idea behind launching that? What was the vision for it? And maybe we can we can start there and then work back into crypto. Sure. I started with um, this started in my old blog, Lapsus Lima, um, which covered issues of general interest in very beautiful ways, I think. And uh, we have a beautiful cadre of writers, many of whom I'm pulling over to Covidian. And um, when the pandemic struck, I simply began maniacally indexing and cataloging everything about the moment that called my attention in terms of changes in sentiment, uh, social attitudes, individual behaviors, everything that stood out, I would record it without necessarily knowing how these things were going to become integrated. And I started finding a series of themes, uh, revelation, uh, uh, the tragic and the panic, um, the hyperbaroque, the new vertigo, uh, the presence of apparitions, the spectral, uh, the, the new layer of hyperreality. Um, and all of this started converging into um, into the thing that is covered in aesthetics. And I have a lot of interlocutors that I bring in as guest columnists, and we're painting a picture of the moment and the experience of the moment, how we felt it before we understood it. Hmm. Okay, fantastic. You, you told me the other day that you think we're at the end of a Spenglerian period. I wonder if you could, I wonder I if you could ex explain that for me. Yes, roughly. Um, history cycles uh, li like, uh, like an animal and uh, like an organism. Uh, this is also uh, treading battalion terror. And, um, and so we um, were at the end of a civilization that's cresting and crashing. And COVID has helped sort of give it the... <laughs> <laughs> the oomph to cross over and there's going to be this convergence of culture tissue that starts to disassociate itself from the rotting corpse of the previous civilization the thing is we're in that moment of deep overlap and uh and we feel that at this point um, I tweeted some days ago that Delta was the reality splitter. It's even in the name. This is the one that makes the fork. And we can see that kind of happening. It wasn't Alpha. Alpha brought the chaos, but Delta makes the fork. So it's been, even COVID itself has its own periodicity, its, um, its own stages, its own phasing. It's a very interesting phenomenon. Wow, that's fantastic. So, okay, what did you learn from the tie in particular that brought you in, especially into the NFT space? Because we're going to talk all about the details of your current NFT project, which which is absolutely fascinating. But let's let's start slowly and let's start with, uh, in an overarching sense, what is it about the tie that you found kind of most illuminating and inspiring when it comes to your current interest in crypto? Thanks for that. Um, it's interesting because when I have thrown the Bataille thing at other fellow theorists, everyone's like, of course, you know, yes, of course. No one else, no one else. Um, but it's, um, I, you know, with an academic background and a fairly, you know, institutional connections, you come from the skeptic side to crypto. The first things you hear about crypto are negative. This is not a real space. This is not for serious pe people. What are you doing here? Uh, this is not interesting even. Don't waste your time. I, I like wasting my time, so I dug. They tell you, don't look here. I have to look there. And um, 
it was NFTs that caught my attention. I was writing a, a blog a chain on epochal art for ribbon farm at the time. And near the end, this NFT thing was in my periphery and uh, always negatively commented upon. This is destructive. This is wasteful. And this is an affront to the environment. Okay, what You're is like, this? I like it. <laughs> let, let, let's look. It looks interesting. And uh, so you dig into the NFT space, which is not exactly the same as the crypto space. It's its own thing. And you start seeing kind of the opposite. There's uh, a lot of uh, effusive, effervescent uh, positivity. Uh, there is a lot of faith in the burgeoning system. And there is, and this is what made the click for me, they're talking about sovereignty. Oh, I was like, okay. So all of these people are fundamentally seeing the same thing from different sides. And I said, this is the whole battalion frame. Destruction waste equals sovereignty. It's the equation and the two sides make the equation, but they just can't see each other. So, but I did, so... <laughs> Monica, maybe for people in my audience who are not as well versed as you and I might be, could you unpack that argument a little bit? Just just get, give us the kind of uh, basic re rendering of that logic, if you would. Um, let's see. Help me with this because I am so um, I've been so I've become enmeshed with the name and, um, sure, and what the implications sure, I can, I can, of the name are. Yeah, sure. I can kick you off. So. Bataille makes this I, this argument that basically under modern capitalist conditions, most people who are just trying to create value and save value, uh, the basic kind of logic of utilitarian rationality, that these types of people are basically slaves or, or servants to, to this larger machine that they don't fully understand. In other words, you can be really rich and make a ton of money, have a really successful business, be an entrepreneur. And yet still be a, a slave, basically, because if all you're really doing is optimizing for economic rationality, you're basically following the dictates of a system that, that's ordering you what to do, basically. You're, you're taking signals from the economy and you're just following those signals. So the, sometimes the richest people are the richest people are in a way, uh, according to Bataille, the, the most ser servile. And so if you think about it, true freedom or true sovereignty um, is the capacity to disobey those dictates in the form of, of wastage or, or what he calls expenditure, expenditure without reserve. And so it's really only in those moments where one engages in profligacy, where one does something that makes no sense, burns resources for no reason whatsoever. It's only in those moments that one is truly sovereign. And so that that's kind of one kind of quick and dirty summary of, of Bataille's perspective. Um, but maybe you want to riff on that when it and comes to... And of course, that, you know, that coincides with so many things that we consider taboo. And uh, the That's sovereign right. is above the law. Uh, the sovereign converges on some level with the trickster. And uh, there is another type of accountability. It's not the same. So, um, yeah, we're in that kind of uh, outlaw space. And that's what I'm finding in crypto. And I find it profoundly healthy, deliciously disturbing. And I am now a part of it. I think I, I, think I fit in. It's kind of the, um, the humble and um, when Ravel speaks of the derangement of the senses, there is something like that happening here. If you see it from, from the paradigm, it seems insane. What are these people doing? They're playing with virtual money, monopoly money. What these people are doing is reassessing value. That's the fundamental pursuit of crypto, I think. And that means that you're going to be playing around with transvaluation. And that's that's deep play. That's dangerous. 
So for people who maybe are not as well versed in this either, the the basic idea here, folks, is just that you know, uh, crypto involves a lot of waste in in a certain sense. You know, people make the argument that it's not waste. Whatever you can have different debates about it, but there's an extraordinary expenditure of energy energy involved in a lot of uh, you know, the processes that secure, uh, blockchain. So, you know, if you look at the, the, the Bitcoin blockchain in particular proof of work, uh, system requires, you know, uh, uh, in aggregate, uh, an extraordinary amount of energy to secure the network, uh, equivalent to that of like a small country really. Um, but if you look at the NFT craze at the moment, um, NFTs also have motifs of, of wastefulness in a few different ways. One is simply that, Ethereum gas fees are really high right now. So to simply mint one NFT might cost like a hundred dollars. And all, all you're really doing is like, in a sense, kind of uploading a JPEG basically it might cost a hundred dollars. People look at that and say, that's bizarre. That's weird. But again, from a battalion perspective, we might become intrigued in this. Right. And then, uh, probably the more extraordinary displays of, of expenditure here have to do with people buying the NFTs. There's now, a, a you know, a massively hot market for NFTs right now. And there's many, many NFT projects now that have floors, uh, meaning the, the the lowest item in the collection uh, into the millions of dollars. So there's a kind of rush or race among the crypto whales to burn their own money on what are basically JPEGs. And so these are these are kind of the Batayan motifs. Monica, what do you think? What do you think people in crypto maybe don't understand fully about these processes that? someone from the art or design or philosophy worlds might be able to shed light on or vice versa. What maybe do people in the design world, uh, you know, not understand about crypto that you've, you've learned from your involvement in, in the, the world more concretely. Mm, I'm fairly divorced from the design world, so I don't know where they sit on this for the most part, but I have noticed, uh, but you pay attention to the discourse less and less. Don't you? You seem like you do. <laughs> Thank you. Vaguely, but uh, that's the thing. The Web3 discourse is immersive theater. You have to get in. And that was, I think, the first realization about this is that you can't just study it at a distance and theorize at the safe remove. You have to get your hands dirty. And I suppose there is some academic resistance to do that because you approach it with a prejudice that this is this is actually truly dirty. No, I'm not going to do that. Um, but when you dive in, you accept and become of the culture. And it's an anthropological uh, approach. And it transforms you. And you have to let it transform you or you never make progress. So it's... Um, and uh, I suppose the NFT space is easy to see as merely wasteful without an overarching narrative. And I think one of the things that I'm trying to provide is a narrative that puts NFTs in strategic position regarding the whole of Web3. Um, to me, what's interesting about Web3 is that I think that the better minds in this space are trying to attack the leading uh, idols, the the broken idols of our age. So they're honing in on very specific and profoundly rooted um, egregores. So say a cursed share is taking on art world. There are other people who are taking on savage things like property, debt, longevity, and these are, this is wild. This is thinking on an incredibly ambitious scale. This is the realm of philosopher kings. Uh, and it's attracting philosophical types um, at that kind of level of conceptualization. So that's where the new academia is. This is where the new professorship and the new stewards and the new mentors are. Um, you're not, you know, digging into, into fragments of Wittgenstein like I was almost did with my life. Um, you're looking at the big problems and providing big and destructive solutions, creative destructive solutions, which I'm very comfortable with. But, you know, it's, um, it's counter-institutional. It is counter-culture in the hardest sense. 
And at some point, there's going to have to be collisions between between both. Tell me a bit more about uh, egregores. What what is an egregore, <laughs> and and why why does this loom so uh, importantly in uh, COVIDian aesthetics? These are the demons. Um, these are the hyper entities that we are immersed in and that we configure and that we are the neurons and the bodies and the voices of. Uh, they exist uh, around us. They emanate from us. And, uh, and it's like a layer of intelligence and behavior. It's, uh, that's not always accounted for. And so all of these institutions are in a way... Uh, congealed egregores. A church is an egregore. Each respective church is an egregore. And sometimes you have these uh, schisms where you're like, okay, I'm going to be my own egregore and uh, leave this one behind. So we're creating something new on an ontological level here. It's uh, almost a magical operation. And I think that the more we can converse amongst ourselves who are involved in these sort of practices, uh, the more effective we will become in summoning these uh, uh, these forms into existence. You mentioned a little bit ago uh, Wittgenstein. I, w- I wanted to ask you, what's the relationship between Wittgenstein and Duchamp? I think you know a thing or two about that. I wrote my bachelor's thesis on this, and I found a whole lot of... Uh, Almost, in, almost always intratextual analogies between their manners of uh, speaking and uh, seeing things in three and four dimensions. And uh, they're basically two they of the like most... They both like chess, right? Yeah. And they're two of the most divisive figures. Duchamp breaks art and Wittgenstein breaks philosophy twice. <laughs> so... Uh, But there isn't, you know, this vehemence. They sort of arrive at it through action and experimentation. It's not, they don't start with this uh, terrorist intent. Uh, They just execute it beautifully. What do you mean by terrorist intent? Is that (laughs) someone like, like Kantian system building is a kind of terrorism? Is that what you mean? That's a way of seeing it. But also Web3 is a kind of terrorism or will soon be considered that i think i think mm. we're on the path is that what you think i think so. i'm afraid so I, I i think it's it's sad but i think it's easy and so easy always wins in these things especially with the state of the narratives right now it's people are just going for these easy triggers knee jerks and it's going to be very easy to say oh this is a counterculture it ha- and it is uh, anti-institutional this is a domestic enemy yeah, right. People are just kind of throwing whatever FUD they can, right? It's like, oh, this is completely fake money. It's a Ponzi scheme. This is a scam. And then a week later, they're like, actually, this is the most dangerous thing in the world. We have to shut it down. It is. Um, and I think uh, I've recently realized, already being on the inside, that I am in the most uh, dangerous business in the world. Is that right? So what kind of signals are you receiving from the outside world, um, you um, know, that, that make you feel that way? From the outside world, not well, many, fortunately. Any, sig- <laughs> any but, signals at all? I mean, I guess you have friends or or people in different institutions who maybe are looking down on you or calling you a criminal or what's going on? I've been called a, a money launderer, which I'm um, certainly not, but uh, but that's the least of it. It's... Um, uh, People don't want to talk about it. There's like a sense of embarrassment. Uh, you know, it's, I, I suppose it's like a friend moving into sex work. Oh, do we want to talk about, do we talk, shall we not talk about this? Um, but for example, I have received a strong response from inside Web3. Uh, you're in, let's talk, uh, especially if you're thinking on this level, because so are we and we need to keep talking and and building this mesh uh, and building a language. And do your friends in the academy still look down on it? My sense is that people are kind of starting to be more interested in it. I think they're starting to be more interested in it. Uh, I have a few academics uh, on the Discord, and they are really bringing it. I love having them there. Um, I think one of our better philosopher kings is a man who's really studied governance in the context of the space and i'm learning vastly from him 
Benjamin Bratton. No. Is he into <laughs> this at all? No, no, no. I, don't I, think I sometimes so. I I sometimes poke fun at him because he he wrote he he wrote a whole book about uh planetary scale governance and it it did not include the word crypto in it. Like we literally have a global computer uh, in the form of the Ethereum blockchain and it wasn't mentioned in his whole book on planetary scale. Uh, that, that's what academia so. does to you, the blinkers. It's just kind of funny. Yeah. It is, it's um, funny. So, okay, so I think this is a good moment then to get into the details of your current project. So you have this production studio called The Accursed Share, uh, an obvious allusion to a book by George Bataille. And your debut project is this curse NFT. Tell us the story about um, this young woman, her face, and what you're trying to do with the NFT project, how it all works. It came to us uh, the way things that are meant to be sometimes do. Uh, this girl, Crystal Schott, uh, is a model. In 2016, she had a backstage picture taken of her. And this picture, like a sort of uh, contemporary uh, rebooted Peter Schlemmel took on a life of its own. It was sold, it changed places, and it found itself as the number one uh, search result for face on Google. Uh, this is sheer algorithmic magic, black magic. And, um, and well, what do you do? Not much until smart contracts started opening up different realms of possibility. And with a curse share, which is um, John Connor and Charlie Curran, in addition to me, um, we're helping Crystal reclaim her face with a new image that can substitute the unwelcome, unauthorized, unresponsive one with one that is actually um, authorized, gainful, and uh, and one that, you know, approved. Um, so um, we joined uh, uh, Strengths with Protagon, uh, the visual effects geniuses uh, behind Marvel and uh, the Avatar movie that's been made now. And uh, and they took this astonishing um, high resolution picture of crystal, the new crystal, the new prism through which to see this space. And, um, and uh, we, uh, using chain link oracles, we have been able to make this image respond to changes in the price of Ethereum. And if I may so say, it's a beautiful NFT. It's very cool. It's very cool. So whoever and buys so it, it will be uh, lifting the curse by uh, repairing the damages that Crystal has suffered by not having her face recognized as hers for all these years. Right, right. It is kind of interesting because if your face is the one that appears on Google search for just the word face, it is kind of interesting philosophically because it's basically the 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 internet brain is determining that you kind of are the platonic form of the face. Like your face, your your face is not just a face; it's the it's face. face as such. It's yeah. it's the face, mm -hmm. and it is interesting that in the status quo, you don't get any upside to that. <laughs> you know, like if you possess if you possess the platonic face, you would think you should get some upside, you know, you should, you should like society should, should reward you in some way if you literally have the platonic face. Uh, but in the status quo, it's like you, you have the platonic face and you get nothing. You're just, you, you're just used to basically your platonic face is used as a resource, as a symbol for whatever anyone is looking for to do with, um, some particular image of a face. And so you're basically introducing, um, NFTs as a device that is going to, solve that problem and allow people who might be the platonic form of something to essentially retain that value and capture that value. And once we open source uh, the model for this, all the platonic forms can come to play. That's tantalizing, isn't it? Um, yeah, absolutely. And also, uh, one of the things that I find most compelling about this particular project is that um, it is trying to reverse the irreversible 
it is you know the stemming of uh, of a river and in, 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 in it's uh it's the detouring of a river in war i find it it's a very um it's a very military gesture it's a sort of a cri de coeur and if you throw that into the commons this is an algorithmic curse you can't you know attack the algorithm you can't go who do you appeal to and then you pull a stunt like this and say okay you know what i'm going to nft my face and re um, recalibrate all the power relations in this whole schema oh what are you showing people and i love that <laughs> hmm. Where do you think all of this goes in the long run? Let's let's be a little speculative and a little futuristic here. I mean, w- since you've been involved in the space now and you're you're actually building real projects in crypto, what do you see as the the underlying longer term trajectory? Uh, you you said to me the other day that you think crypto represents a, a transvaluation of values uh, to cite Nietzsche. Uh, I'm curious if you could speak a little bit more to that and and where you see all of this going. Yeah. I see this as the first original subculture of the 21st century. And you have normie politics that are completely entrenched in a sort of degrading tribalism that's becoming more and more idiotic. Uh, And it's basically dog whistles versus dog whistles. It's reaching very supine levels. And at the same time, you have this, for now, parallel universe where people are... fucking around and finding out so we are the new hippies and the new goths and the new avant-garde and we're finding shapes we're finding ways to be uh we are designing lifestyles we are building customs we are building um uh law you know, I mean, that's one of the joys of the Discord. I have lawyers who are approaching law from the crypto angle because it's one of the levels where they can do the most fundamental interventions. It's not accessory. And so everything here is working on a sort of foundation level still. And uh, the cultural effervescence is immense. The, the ground cover is immense. And I'm optimistic. My hope is that NFTs are what pushes Web3 into the mainstream. Uh, I'm very optimistic about that. I think art always has to be the tip of the poisoned tip of the spear for cultural change. It introduces the first um, imaginations of the paradigm shift of what things can be like, of what can be done, of how hope can be configured um of what uh the fantasy life can be like and you know nfts are they're fun they're cute Uh, i think they're going to be much easier to uh to adopt and to have people on board than for example uh you know bitcoin or the the harder currencies um because it's also gamified at this point it's uh there's these charming packages um and it's developing an aesthetic which i am hoping a cursor can help uh sort of reach uh, its tipping point and once we pierce the veil of reality all the rest of web3 goes in Hmm. and what is this difference between crypto and nfts that you alluded to before i thought that was kind of interesting this would not be obvious to a lot of people what do you mean by that These are still not um, congruent spaces. I'm more involved in the NFT space, but I have friends in crypto who still don't understand the NFT space. And I do think that there are people in the NFT space that don't understand crypto. So some translation is required, and I'm still trying to figure out um, how to do that. And of course... I guess in an... In a nutshell, it's like people who are only interested in NFTs are more or less coming from an art art angle. Uh, they understand they understand the art aspect, but not the rest. And then the people who you are calling crypto but not into NFTs are kind of more like the Bitcoin maximalist, hard nosed kind of Austrian economics types. But at the same time, you see a lot of um, 
the spirit of uh, stockbrokers in the NFT. It's about price, it's about gaming, it's about speculation, and it's becoming about art. It's still in that process. It's a maturation. And I remember when I, this was in May, when I recorded uh, uh, the Contain podcast with uh, Barrett Avner, um, he told me about coins called uh, like ass and boob, uh, you know, silly, silly coins. And, and I think, I thought this was very legit because uh, that's the developmental phase this is in. It's still gaga, boo boo, you know, it's inarticulate. But any minute now, it will say its first word. <laughs> and when it does, I want to be there. I want to catch it. And if possible, I want, uh, I want us to be that first word. Fascinating, fascinating. You have this idea that markets are sentimental. Tell me a little bit more about that. What, what does that mean to say that markets are sentimental and you know what are the implications there? Um, it has to do with aesthetics, which I think of as sentiment, as sort of before things clot into politics and uh, become uh, dreadfully serious, uh, there is there are vibes, there are feelings, there are moods. And uh, COVID has been throwing a lot of that at us, and we are slowly integrating it on many levels, individual, uh, groupal. We have a lot of in-groups now, and um, and social. So, and all of this is happening at once. Um, and it's very... There's this whole, you know, irrational exuberance that Greenspan spoke about, which is almost, a, you know, a, uh, critical of what we're doing. And it was a very sort of establishment line. Markets are irrational. And I don't know, is that what you see when you see them behave? I see effective market. Um, th they're premised on affection. They're premised on uh libido they're premised on instinct on urge and um and i think that the 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 summit of this and i really think it was the most important news of the year uh, until afghanistan and you know people are distracted with uh january 6 but i am distracted with gamestop <laughs> gamestop was a flashpoint, a historical flashpoint. It was the storming of the symbolic Bastille. It was beautiful. It was, and uh, and it was almost that moment of penetration. You saw hedge fund owners crying on C-SPAN, just bereaved at, and it's not just losing spectacular amounts of money in spectacular amounts uh, of uh, in a spectacularly short time it's about the paradigm breaking how is this possible how can this happen why are they not selling and you could see how disconcerted the establishment was and of course then you know um the government was like, oh, these are extremists and, you know, they're probably aligned with the right. No, they're not. They're, um, they're free agents. They're non-state actor. <laughs> New non-state actors. And they're going to have a lot of trouble wrapping their heads around that. This is not the first. It's, it's I mean, it it is the first, but it won't be the last. And but it was a very significant moment and we're not talking about it anymore we should we will i mean wait we'll just wait until the gamestop phenomenon and the kind of sentimental affective uh self-generated market manipulation hordes enter onto DeFi in a kind of mass scale i mean that's when things are going to get really really crazy and awesome like that's what i'm that's what i'm gearing up for because if you thought gamestop was cool um, you know, the whole Wall Street bets moment around GameStop, GameStop that is. Um, and I completely agree with you. I loved the whole thing. And uh, I just, I loved it. As as you say, um, wait until, just wait until that phenomenon 
starts taking place on permissionless decentralized DeFi markets. So there's literally there's no there's no uh, authority that even could clamp down on it if they wanted to. Uh, that's when things that's when things are going to get really kooky. When do you uh, think that might that's, happen? It's a good question. I think it's just a matter of uh, increasing adoption on DeFi, and then at, you know because basically what the Wall Street bets phenomenon was what that moment really was was mostly just the mass adoption of trading tools like on Robinhood. Like that's what Robinhood represents really, right? It's like just putting uh, the trading markets into the pockets of of the populist dispossessed uh, you know masses who up until Robinhood were much less likely to even have a trading account. So Robinhood basically accelerates adoption among, you know, the the disenfranchised masses. Um, and then something like the Wall Street Bets phenomenon was able to happen because of that degree of low cost mass adoption. But there's also uh, enabled by Robin Hood. Uh, going back to the markets are sentimental, not irrational. That's just the wrong spectrum. The 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 ratio is not for markets. It's a thesis. And um, why GameStop? Why MNC? Because people care about, you know, you want, you love them. You have memories, good memories of these places of these of these uh, businesses maybe you had a teenage job there maybe you had your first kiss there these are the things that impress you and it has nothing to do with with you know how markets are usually analyzed so the whole thing was shocking like why and why GameStop for obvious reasons because we love GameStop totally. Yeah, the only problem was that it's with these traditional centralized financial institutions that were able to pull the plug on things. But we're gonna we're gonna reach a point soon where this is happening inside of DeFi systems that have no plug to be pulled, and then things are gonna get really really wacky because it, it's it's actually kind of boggles the mind to think what what really would have happened had the the GameStop moment not been throttled by you know centralized actors. Um, th there's, there's really no limit to, to what that kind of affective, sentimental, uh, group motivated market manipulation can do. And yeah, so it's, it's very fascinating. You told me, uh, the other day we were talking about Beeple, uh, for, for people who don't know, Beeple was kind of the first artist to really have a breakthrough kind of NFT sale in the, in the, in the multi-millions. And this was kind of the first time that, that people were like, whoa, this NFT thing, what? WTF, you know, um, what's your read on people? Um, uh, because I, you said some interesting things and I wanted you to kind of explain how you read that moment. It reminds me a bit of, you know, Duchamp's fountain. It's, um, and the timing of people is astonishing though. Really? You can't make this up. Uh, the pandemic is declared, uh, as such on March 11 of 2020, my birthday. And Beeple sells the first 5,000 days for $69 million on, you know, on Christie's on March 11, 2021. That's a year. That's a year in the life of the Covidian. And I think that's like the first whole period. Um, it was it was great. It's, uh, and at the same time, it's, uh, there is still this complication in the NFT space where you're still going for institutional approval uh, for sanction to Christie's, to Sotheby's, that, um, you know, it's, um, we have to take a turn from that. We have to become self-sustaining, but I think we're on track to do that. And also what makes Beeple so interesting is that I think he is a sort of first um, diplomatic envoy to the art world in that capacity in which you have this trickster figure that is embedded now in both worlds and the art world uh, deigns to give you some space and, you know, we're entertaining you. We hope to assimilate you in due course. And, and so it's an intent. But it's also a standoff. 
And there's this almost sexual tension that has to be resolved in some way. It's it's a very sexy moment there. Yeah, yeah, definitely. I mean, what do you make of the larger NFT economy as as, as you look at it? Because it's it's very crazy, right? There's obviously a lot of. I mean, I think I think it's fairly it's fair to say there's a lot of froth in the market. I mean, basically, almost anything is kind of getting uh, snatched up, and and with all these crazy uh, prices. So, I mean. W- it's not, in other words, it's, it's, it's not all rosy, right? I mean, it's, it's, uh, and you alluded to this before you alluded to this, that, that it's kind of dirty There there's this weird kind of, um, vulgar insanity to it as well. It's, it's kind of interesting and beautiful. And there are all these attractive opportunities for, um, you know, noble projects. And then there's also all this froth and all this, all this, uh, you know, kind of crazy, dirty, greedy, dynamics but that's also you know healthy because it's a maturing developing market that is finding its values and that's always a messy search um so i'm I'm comfortable with that and it will refine itself uh right now for example i think the ruling value of the space is scarcity and you know induce scarcity and there's any number of ways to do this and game this but very soon it should be quality people are starting to take a greater interest in the content the concept the product the execution and it's starting to align with prices more so it's it's maturing and at this point it's a bazaar it's very fun so do you do you believe that in the long term the equilibrium is the all the best artists have the highest selling NFTs and there's this kind of tight nicely cor- correlated relationship between price and value on the open market uh in crypto and the quality of the art do you, do you believe in that kind of long term convergence or no. no no I don't but I think it's going to be moving in that direction rather than in simply staying stuck on the scarcity game there are other values so to if gain. it's gonna if it's gonna move in that direction why not go all the way in that direction over time because consensus is difficult and i think the space has room for uh lack of consensus in many regards and that's good that's healthy so uh i think a lot of crap art will subsist and a lot of good art will too and that's fine. We've always needed bad art. And uh, and good art is also equally important. Totally, totally. I'm curious, um, when you were younger, uh, I know that uh, you studied at an Opus Dei school, a conservative <laughs> yeah. school, and, and you studied philosophy, among other things. I, I was curious if your early childhood education in Aristotle and Thomism uh, had any kind of lingering impact on you? What, what, what did, did you, did you take anything away from that, that education specifically in Aristotle and Thomism? Yeah, less Thomism because of temperament. And I do think that if philosophers are like drugs, you just have better chemistry with some of them others. And that's fine. Uh, I'm very sympathetic to Aristotle. I studied Aristotle, um, with excellent teachers and, One of my signal accomplishments in college was pulling my marvelous teacher away from Opus and into, you know, just civilian life. So these are um, reasonable people who want to be having reasonable discussions. And Aristotle is, um, is a beautiful, he's a beautiful philosopher, as is Plato, fond of both of them. Yeah. (laughs) What do you make of um, American culture relative to your own background from from South America? Like, do you think as you as you look at your peers in in you know whatever peer groups you see yourself in in, in the United States, do you feel that you have an edge, a certain kind of um, extra zeal or vivacity that uh, comes from South America that uh, that 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 allows you to? I don't know, maybe enjoy a certain amount of freedom, a certain amount of energy that your American peers lack? What, what's going on there? Do you see anything there or no? That's such an interesting question. Oh, I don't know. 
some of it is cultural, but I also, you know, I had a very, um, a very uh, well-governed and uh, well-packaged life. And I could have easily stayed on one of many uh, sensible tracks. There was no reason that necessarily explains this detour that is not premised on character. And I think that's one of the things that I'm noticing as emerging in this space uh, in the Web3 space is a lot of the interesting people are characters. And that's important because it's, for example, something that is being lost in politicians and it is being lost in institutions. They're not cultivating character. And, oh, we're going back to Aristotle there. Um, I'm a character. I'm a kooky person. And, um, and I cultivate that. Right. Yeah. I, I do wonder if there's something going on there where that type of person is more likely to kind of shine in in the new frontier of of Web3, because in a way it's like, uh, you know, what are NFTs? Uh, what are, you know, tokens and the all of the all of these different, uh, you know, kind of symbolic units of value, if not uh, it's kind of all brand, right? It's all it's all kind of differentiation. It's all uh, unique personalities, tastes, symbols, brands. Th th these kind of all have have something in common. Tokens and NFTs have something in common with 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 strong characters or strong personalities. Uh, in in a way, it's 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 all going into this world of um, just symbolic units that either do or do not attract energy or something like that. Energy, literally and figuratively, it's a. Uh, it's interesting that this is what is being channeled and commanded. Uh, I find that very, very curious, and it's also, yeah, the character thing is something that I've been pondering. I think character is becoming increasingly important. We live in character. We are breaking character less. Our lives are less compartmentalized. And now, you know, having been through lockdown and with the collapse of workplace into home, into everything and everything all at once, we are sort of becoming our selves, yeah. shadow selves, ideal selves. All our spectrum is incorporated and projected. It's wild. What is happening to us on psychological, psychodynamic levels is very interesting. And one of the things that I tap into in talking with younger people, especially, is a lot of talk of, oh yeah, this guy, he runs a cult, this guy has a sect. Uh, on Twitter, we all have any number of followers. And these are curious hierarchical dynamics that are going to have consequences going forward. Charisma is becoming a value unto itself again. And that's not necessarily a bad thing. Yeah, that's fascinating. Well, it's kind of like the person who has the platonic face and shows up first in Google search results, there, there's something similar there to the highly charismatic personality. You know, it's like in, in both cases, we are approaching this, this point at which having any type of remarkable or unique skill or tendency or trait can now be encoded and, and made liquid financially uh with increasing ease and and increasing liquidity so it's pretty it, it's pretty fascinating it's like it's it's almost as if everything will find its economic level um even even those aspects of the self which previously were uh not available to kind of market market dynamics and it's very funny because like a lot of people who would have been a Marxist and would have wanted to say something like, stop the market from penetrating people, man, you know, don't let the capitalist exploitation enter your soul, man, you know, that type of that type of kind of Marxist humanism, that kind of anti technological Marxist humanism 
which I think it's fair to say it's, it was kind of a very strong, if not the dominant kind of attitude on, on the left for, for quite a while. And at least like the radical left, the educated kind of radical left in the, in the Western countries that those types of people who would have thought that I think now are going to be looking at web three and they're going to be saying like, Oh no, actually we need to let capitalism into our soul because this is our ticket. Uh, this is our ticket out of our like, uh, servitude basically. And, and that is kind of the, that is kind of the the bargain that capitalism has always made though, isn't it? It, it is kind of what's so sinister about it. It's like at the margin, it is, you know, let it into your soul a little bit more, chop things up, monetize them more effectively. You will get paid more and that's good. But then also everyone is letting capitalism far, far more into their souls. <laughs> and so it's like, But there's also the gazing into the abyss and the reciprocity. And sometimes you discover this is not as you become your fear to not manifest. So there's a lot of interesting transformations happening at and I think crypto broadly is the original uh, 21st century populism. Look at what is happening at the grassroots level. It's, um, it's an almost organismic reaction to the system's complete inability to hold itself up. Well, you know what I think it, is, it really is, is it's separating capitalism from the state in a way that is way more rigorous than ever. And I think this is, this is the problem that historically in, in, you know, modern European history, capitalism and the state have always been, uh, pretty, pretty inseparable. Like there's never been a very, very strong formal differentiation. So that's led, you know, the whole history of, of, you know, theorists of capitalism and the whole history of, of theorists of the state find it really hard to, to really separate the two. And so, you know, if you look at someone like Marx, uh, yeah, you know, Marx's critique of capitalism is, um, really also a critique of the state under capitalism. It's, it's, it's a, it's a critique of this thing that modern capitalism is, which it's always been the, the capitalist economy and the state that it kind of, um, seduces into its, its support and its management. So it, the entire horizon of modern politics and, and, and modern economics uh, all of modern political theory as we know it uh, has never really been able to separate the two and not for not through any fault of its own. It's because there's there's never there's never actually been uh, the technological affor affordances that allow us to coherently talk about economics truly outside of, of state power. And that's I think what's really revolutionary about crypto is that, um, yeah, capitalism is intensifying without a doubt. I mean, the, the crypto economy is an extraordinary intensification of capitalism no way around that, but it's on a new vector. It's on this new branch or fork, uh, which, which firmly and, and distinctly is shooting off from its historical alliance with, with state power, or, or even one might say historical reliance on state power. And so now you have the prospect of a, of a capitalism that is genuinely, uh, detached from state power. And I think you can make the argument that, that that's actually just much better. That's that's actually a vector of liberation or a vector of emancipation to basically, you know, capitalize ourselves, but to do it through these um, truly grassroots, truly autonomous uh, uh, networks of of code and contracts that we code ourselves for ourselves with ourselves and don't require any third party to mediate or to guarantee. That's actually a kind of capitalism that maybe we do want to intensify. Maybe that is actually the vector of liberation. Um, that is the way through capitalism that that Marx himself arguably um, even even kind of uh, foresaw and 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 favored. So I think that's the key difference. It, it it's the separation from the state. It is, and it's kind of um, kind of analogous to the separation of church and state in terms of the repercussions and the second and third order consequences that this is going to have. We're in the business of world making. And that's a very messy business. <laughs> yeah, that's right. And then the worlds that are made are going to be their own sovereign. Yes, they are. Straight up. I mean, like the, you know, a, 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 a DAO, like a gaming DAO that becomes big enough. It's like, you know, if you imagine something like Fortnite, that's, that's a uh, completely DAOified, has its own token, uh, which is like completely self-enforcing and it's all, um, you know, governed 
uh, in a in a strictly decentralized way then like something like Fortnite on the blockchain is straight up a self uh enforcing self-governing country basic basically and this is going to breed diversity political diversity that we can do not allow ourselves in our lives all the political promiscuity is coming out to play and you can find you know societies tailored to your taste that's amazing right right so i think i think that's actually much more uh, emancipatory and and liberating than than it would have been historically with with the kind of capitalist intensification uh that historically relied on the state and was always a part of the state i think the state is kind of what always made that so toxic and so kind of horrific um i think i think once you you put a wedge between those two with cryptography and you allow for like truly autonomous capitalism and capitalist like unit units and and, and world making I, I suddenly think like what used to be uh, a bad thing suddenly becomes an exciting thing and to bring it full circle because everything in this universe just sort of loops it's all full of strange loops it's beautiful uh, the utopians and this is a design concern uh, design studies utopias and there are no more utopias in the real world where do you go what do you do whom do you do it with where are the utopians? They're not in academia. They're not in government. They're in crypto. They're building cities in crypto. They've taken the Renaissance spirit of building from the ground up as far as it goes intergenerationally. Oh, that's a huge commitment. And they're taking it. They're like, yeah, intergenerational wealth is that. It's that kind of perpetuity, which is not, you know, uh, just continuism, which is what you get in academia. It's uh, creativity. It's creativity. And, um, and creativity is diversification. So I think it's going to be really fun. And one of the things that I have uh, set up in the DAO is a diplomatic channel because we should be establishing diplomatic relations with other DAOs. Commerce, trade, arts, um, exchange, uh, hostages, visitors. Mm -hmm. Totally, totally. So Monica, maybe you could break down for my audience concretely, what are you doing at this moment? How can people get involved? How can people follow you? Uh, because the, the NFT, the Curse NFT project, which is your current main project, uh, it's a little, it's a little complicated. It just has a few moving parts. So just break down for people like, you know, if, if someone wants to buy, where should they go? If they want to just join the discord, where should they go? If they well, break down exactly um, how people can follow and get involved and contribute to what you're doing. You can follow us on a cursed uh, act, act shareholder uh, on Twitter, but um, our webpage is accursedshare.art and our auction will be held until September 13 at cursednft.com. Now, to participate in the auction, you need to own one of our a thousand Genesis tickets. These have all sold out, but they can be found in the aftermarket. The, those are tickets to have access to the auction. Among other things, they have a whole bunch of utility and benefits uh, that we prepared an eight an H page fact to address. But yes, this is your ticket to the auction. And where can people find those? Where can people find that secondary market if they wanted to see the current prices for those tickets? At OpenSea. At OpenSea. Just Google like yes. Curse NFT on OpenSea or something. Curse tickets. Curse tickets. Okay, cool. So people can check that out if you're interested. And uh, please do. I think you said you have a Discord too. Is that available for people to? We have a Discord, and uh, if you want to, um, at this point, it's exclusive for ticket owners. But feel free to oh, okay. reach out to me, and let's talk about integrating because i do want to bring people in the community uh who are builders and who resonate with what we're doing totally great well i think i'm sure there'll be some people in my audience who who meet that description and then of course there's uh and the in terms of oh. uh coming projects after curse we have collaborations uh, we've been able to announce collaborations with uh the painter julian guyan 
and uh, with the avalanches. So we're moving into, you know, bringing traditional art in, uh, bringing sampling and music, and uh, we'll see what happens. We're making new things. Excellent, excellent. And of course, people should check out your newsletter, Covidian Aesthetics on Substack. I'll put a link in the show notes to all, all to all of these things so people can find them easily. And 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 sooner or later, sometime soon, I'm, I'm getting Monica on to Urbit. We'll, we'll have to... Uh, he is. Up. He's onboarding me on Urbit, the final frontier. Well, I mean, and if, I'm so glad. To- if you're if you're interested in esoteric Web3 stuff, you've got to get on Urbit. So I'm getting you on there. I've already given Monica her planet and I will personally he onboard has. her soon uh, to, to Urbit. So look out for that. Thank you. I'll see you there. Anything else, Monica, that we didn't cover that you want to get in before we uh, mm, call it a day? I think I we covered think a lot of ground. Of. This is really fun. This was beautiful, and uh, I hope we can do it again. And I'd love to hear from the audience. Get in touch. My personal um, Twitter handle is Lapsus Lima, and uh, let's talk. All right. Awesome. Hey, thank you so much for listening to the podcast. You made it all the way to the very end, so you must really like the show. In that case, I would be super grateful if you'd be so kind to leave a review on Apple Podcasts. All you have to do is go to otherlife.co slash review. That's otherlife.co forward slash review. And it'll send you an Apple podcast. Just leave a review. You can be honest. Tell me what you really think. I'd really appreciate it because it'll help other people find the show. And I'm really trying to grow out the podcast. So thanks for listening. And thank you for leaving a review. I really appreciate it.